Okay, I believe we are streaming live. And hello world. If you're out there on Facebook or YouTube, this is Meathead. And hello, Dan. You're always among the first to clock in. Good to see you. Happy New Year. Happy Holidays. <clears throat> and uh, I thought tonight we would do a little conversation around prime rib. Um, I just did some prime rib for Christmas, and uh, I tried something a little different and something a little new, and um, I thought I'd share some of my ideas on cooking prime rib and some technique and uh, uh, because I know a lot of folks like to do prime rib for New Year's Eve. So with that thought in mind, let me grab my notes here. There we are. Move them to the other monitor. Okay. I'll close that. Okay. <clears throat> well, I mean, we certainly have a magnificent piece of meat if we're doing a prime rib, or if you're doing um, a Chateaubriand, a beef tenderloin, which is where the Chateaubriand is cut from. Uh, these are super premium, super expensive, and super marvelous tasting pieces of meat. And it would be a terrible shame to overcook them. But most recipes for cooking them are recipes for overcooking. And the trick to getting them right is doing something that you probably have heard of, if not practiced, and that's reverse sear. Now, I know a lot of people think that's a technique for doing steaks and chops, but it's also a technique for doing chicken and turkey and prime rib and beef tenderloin. The whole concept behind reverse sear is that if you keep the temperature low, it will cook more evenly. If you put it in a high temperature oven, and a grill is nothing but an oven or a smoker, a lot of energy builds up on the outside. And as it travels to the center, you get a rainbow effect. You get a dark crust, which we want. And then below that, you get a brown layer. And below that, you get a thin tan layer. And then below that, you get a pink layer. And below that, finally, in the center, it's perfectly medium rare or 130, 135, which is the temperature at which beef is most tender and most juicy. So the goal is, is to have maximum amount of maximum tender and juicy. And the way to do that is you start out with a low temperature, not a high temperature. And that brings the temperature up gently and evenly so that the meat, if you think of it as a thick tube, will be even temperature edge to edge, but it's not really dark brown and crusty on the outside. Now, a lot of recipes want you to start by high temperature browning the exterior, but that's how you get that rainbow effect. You're going to do that at the end, and if you're doing it on a grill, you're going to divide your grill in half and set it up in two zones. A hot zone, where all the fire and flame and coals and if it's a gas grill, the flames are. And then a not hot zone or an indirect zone where there is no energy directly below the food. You don't want to do it on a rotisserie. It's too hot. So you just set it down on the indirect side and warm convection air gently warms it. That's all there is to it. When it gets close to your target temperature, let's say you like it medium rare, as do I, 130 to 135. When it gets to 120 or so, then you move it over to the hot side and you lift the lid because you don't want to roast it anymore. It's almost finished roasting. You're just now cooking the surface. You cooked the interior on the indirect side. Now you're cooking the surface. You're cooking the interior separately from the surface. So at the surface, you put it over direct inf infrared heat 
directly over flame, directly over coal, and you're going to sear that surface area. And you're going to roll it over about a quarter turn and sear. It takes only about four or five minutes, depending on how hot your burners are or your coals are. And then you're going to turn it some more, and you're going to turn it some more, and you're going to turn it some more until you've got a good all-round sear. And that's how you do a classic reverse sear roast. And that's the right way to do a prime rib or a beef tenderloin and get it perfectly even temperature, even color through the center. And it will be absolutely spectacular. But yours truly being the tinkerer that I am known to be, I threw in a couple of twists this year. I started out at a low temperature in a smoker. And I left it there for about a half hour to an hour. Actually, it was about an hour. Just enough to give it a light smoke flavor. I didn't want a heavy smoke flavor. And I didn't want to cook the meat that much. So I gave it a very light smoke flavor right out of the fridge. It's cold. So it's not going to absorb a lot of energy. And I gave it about an hour of smoke. Then I sealed it in a plastic bag. Sucked out the air with a vacuum sealer and put it in a sous vide bath. Now, by now, probably most of you know what sous vide is. But just in case you don't, here's a very short summary. In this, it's, a, it's a tub of hot water. And I set the temperature for 130. Actually, 131. At 131, that's medium rare. And when you drop the bag of meat into 131 degree water, it slowly warms up to 131. But it can't go to 132 or 135 or 155, which is well done. You can't overcook food in a sous vide bath. And that's the trick of it. Now, it's not boiling the meat. We don't want to boil the meat because it's in a plastic bag. So it's not being dissolved by the water. All of its flavor is locked in. Most of it. Some moisture comes out of the meat. And you can leave it there for hours. In fact, I left it there for seven hours. And that's how long it takes to get it to 131, edge to edge. And then a few extra hours, which tenderizes it. And the enzymes kick in and soften it. So started with an hour in the smoker. Oh, oh, I skipped a step. Sorry. Before it goes in the smoker, I salted it. That's dry brining. You give it a good layer of salt, about a, a half a teaspoon of, more, of Morton Karst kosher salt per pound of meat. And that gives them salt chance in an hour in the smoker and seven hours in the sous vide to penetrate. And it will penetrate deep. But I didn't put any spices on it yet because they're too big. They won't go, they won't go into the meat. So after six, seven hours in the sous vide, I had to go over the river and through the woods to my niece's house. It was about a half hour away. But I was able to leave the meat in the bag at 131. Oh, I didn't explain. It gets to 131 and it stays at 131 with a device, it's a tube that has a heating element in it. It's called a sous vide immersion um, uh, uh, temperature. It's, 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 it's essentially a heating element with a fan that circulates the water. So it's an immersion circulator. And um, uh, they're available for, oh, I've seen some for $100, $150 on up to $700, $800 or so. And I use one called Joule, J-O-U-L-E, really nice. Talks to my smartphone. I can set the temperature precisely. And it just holds the meat at perfect 131 for as long as I want it to. So I took the thing, unplugged it, because it has to plug in to get heat up. But it was only a half hour. The temperature hardly, hardly changed. When I got to my niece's house, plugged it back in, went right back to 131. And it sat there continuing to heat for another hour, hour and a half, until it was almost dinner time. Then, when it's almost dinner time, 
I unplugged it, took the meat out of the bag, put it in a big pan, patted it dry, because a lot of moisture comes out of the meat when it's in the bag. Patted it dry, painted it with beef fat or beef tallow, which I'll talk about in a minute, that was from the trimming of the meat, and painted it with the tallow so it had a thin layer of oil on it, and then hit it with this stuff. Meatheads, amazing red meat rub. Um, and it's got some really nice spices in it, really nice flavor. And sprinkled that all over the surface and took it out to my niece's 15-year-old Weber Genesis gas grill. Fired it up as hot as we can get it. Put the meat down on the surface. Lift the lid. Again, we're cooking the surface, not the interior. Interior's already been cooked in the sous vide bath. So now we're just searing it. We're just creating that marvelous crust. Rotate it five or ten minutes on each side until I've got a beautiful dark sear. Bring it inside. Cut it open. Beautiful color. And I'll try to find some pictures to show you. That is one marvelous technique. Now, there are a couple of other tricks that I use, and I'll, uh, I, I see a couple of questions coming in, mostly from Facebook. I don't know if YouTube's getting this. Um, if anybody's watching on YouTube, would you just check in with the comments and let me know that we're going through to YouTube? Um, but in any case, um, the other tricks that I use is I remove the bones. Now, I know a lot of people like bone-in standing rib roast, but the bones are essentially a heat block. They're like the tiles on the bottom of the space shuttle to reflect energy. They reflect energy and reflect heat. If you've ever had a ribeye steak with a bone in, you know that the meat next to the bone is not as cooked as on the other side. In fact, if you like your meat medium rare, the meat next to the bone is pretty rare usually. So I remove the bones so it will cook evenly on all sides. And those bones I set aside because they're going to be an entirely separate meal. They're fantastic. Love to smoke those bones for three, four, five hours. The meat in between those bones, little meat on top of those bones. That is just one delicious meal. So now I've got not only my prime rib meal, but I have my rib bone meal, which is essentially baby back ribs from the steer. They're steer back ribs. Then I had, and I had 18 people to feed. I also peel off the outer muscle, which is called the spinalis. And if you've ever looked at a ribeye steak, you've noticed that there's one big round muscle in the center and then there's this little crescent muscle on the outside with a thick layer of fat between the two. And everybody hates that thick layer of fat. They cut it out. But that muscle that wraps around, and I'll show you some pictures of this, is called the spinalis dorsi. And it is the best tasting muscle on the animal. It's like Wagyu. It's really beautifully marbled and it's incredible. But it, because it's on the outside, it almost always overcooks. So I peel it off and it comes off and it's maybe 18 inches long, six inches on one end and two inches. It looks like a giant salmon fillet. It's only about an inch thick. And it's, that's another meal. Actually, I get two meals out of that. Then I trim off all the excess fat. Nobody eats all that thick layer of fat. And I don't want the fat in the way of my rub. I want my rub on the beef. So I sprinkle with rub on the beef. So I trim off almost all the fat. And I render that fat. And that fat is what I used to paint the meat before I put the, uh, the rub on there. And we'll talk a little bit about rendering fat in a little bit too. And if you're into it, you can make candles and soap from that fat. But that fat is also very good for things like french fries. In fact, I don't know if you're aware, but until 1993, all McDonald's french fries were cooked in beef fat, or beef tallow it's called, or suet it's sometimes called. And that's because 
it has a marvelous flavor. And when they switched from beef fat at McDonald's to vegetable oil, people went nuts because the flavor changed. McDonald's fries have always been good, but they were better when they were cooked in beef fat. So that's a quick thumbnail summary. I have to look at my notes, see if I left anything important out of how I've done it. And while we're talking, I'll get you some pictures of this process and we'll answer some questions. Um, and let's take a look at the questions over here and see what we got. Good old Dan Mancuso, who never misses. Hello, Dan. Andy Augustine, I cut plenty of prime rib, but I've never had one. Love to learn more. When you cut it, you mean you're, you're a butcher, perhaps? Oh, you really should try. I know they're expensive. You know, um, it, it, it's called prime rib, but it is still subject to USDA labeling. And so you can have choice, top choice, prime, and then you can get into Wagyu and other things. All prime rib is not necessarily USDA prime grade. In fact, USDA choice grade prime rib is delicious. It's called prime rib because it's what's known as a primal cut. The animal has several primal cuts on it, big cuts, which are then broken down into smaller cuts. So it's a rib primal or a prime rib and it's not necessarily USDA Prime. And USDA Choice is just fine. That is a very tender and delicious cut of meat. Um, there's also a grade that is not well known called Top Choice. And it's the best of the choice cuts. It's almost prime. But it's priced as choice. So that's a, a good one to get if you can get it. Hello, Charlie Jones and Daniel Blake. Renee Miller? Am I talking to Keith's wife, Renee? Are you tuned in from Florida? I, you know, your husband and I went to a high school basketball games today, if that's the Renee Miller I know and love. And your dog spent the day with my dog. I, I love high school basketball. Keith Miller and I, my friend and neighbor, a retired fireman and a local um, a substitute teacher at the high school. We, the Chicago area, which is where I live, has some great high school basketball players. I mean, I saw Kevin Garnett play here in high school. You know, I saw I, I saw Derrick Rose play here in high school. I've just seen a dozen or more great professional players play in high school. Unfortunately, today's games didn't have any of them. There was there was a kid who was six ten, but uh, I think he had lead shoes on. Um, but uh, it's just fun. I love watching high school sports. Um, you know, they're they're. they're they're not playing for the NIL money. They're not getting into the transfer portal next year. They're not sitting out the ball game to get ready for the NFL. It's just pure sport and pure love. Boy, they play fast, these kids. It was exciting. We saw uh, three games today, and uh, it was a lot of fun. Unfortunately, my local neighborhood team got beat. Um, okay. Um Chris Peterson says, without making yourself liable for bad info, dang lawyers, what are your thoughts on turkey cook temp? Bacteria elimination is a function of time and temp. That's correct. Keep poultry at 145 long enough and it's safe. We always do a whole bird, not spatchcock and broken down, and like to pull it at 152, but the food safety boogeyman always makes me squeamish. <clears throat> okay. Um, we'll deal with that. It's a turkey question, but it's a question that applies to all meats. And that is USDA gives us a temperature at which they deem it safe. And that temperature is a temperature usually at which bacteria die almost instantly. Um, for example, for turkey, it's 165. But if you cook your turkey to 160, the bacteria are not all dead at that temperature, but if you hold it at that temperature for a few minutes, you kill, you can kill them all. And there's a table from USDA, it's their table, on my website, on AmazingRibs.com, um, that shows you how long you have to hold meat at what temperature to pasteurize it or make it safe. The problem with turkey and chicken is, is now, all right, let's jump over here for a second to beef. 
beef, they recommend 145. Now that is medium. It's past medium rare. Medium rare is 130 to 135. That's 10 degrees past medium rare. It is pink and it is getting dry. And if every restaurant served their steaks at a minimum of 145, they'd all go out of business in a month, in a week. So no steakhouse follows the USDA minimum requirement. And it's a good thing because these bacteria can't get much past the surface. Um, they're big and there's no way for them to get deep into the meat. And they're always on the surface. They come from the outside of the animal or from bacteria in the digestive system of the animal. But it gets on the surface of the meat. It, it's not inside the meat. Now, for turkey, I recommend 160 rather than 165 because when you take it out of the oven, it's still at 160 long enough to meet the minimum USDA requirement. Um, but I know people that take it down to 155, 150. You're talking about 152. I don't like the texture of the meat at that temperature. I think it's kind of slimy. So if you like it at 152, you can. I don't know how long you've got to hold it at 152 to make it safe. It's probably in the neighborhood of 20 minutes. You go to my table on AmazingRibs.com um, and uh, you go to the search box and search for um, USDA food safety temperatures or something like that. Poke around. You'll find it. If you can't, drop me a note, meathead at AmazingRibs.com. I'll find that table for you. And I'll tell you how long you got to hold it at 152 to make it safe. But I don't think you'll like the texture. I think the texture feels funny. Yes, it is, Renee. Oh, look, at the picture is, <laughs> that's McGoof, McGee. That's her. <laughs> Hello, Renee. Uh, yes, Renee, your dog and my dog had a fun day today. Um, while Keith and I went to the basketball game, um, our two dogs, which were born within a week of each other, um, uh, tore each other to shreds. Um, how nice to see you, Renee. Um, any thoughts on using a slow cooker for a rib roast? You know, you can do that, but the temperatures inside get pretty warm and essentially you're making a stew. A lot of the liquid comes out of the meat and now the meat is sitting in a liquid. So it's simmering and you're making a beef stew. You're not getting a good dark brown crust. And a lot of that liquid that comes out is full of flavor. Dry cooking is where you can capture most of the flavor. So I, I think, you know, roasting it in an oven or on a grill or a smoker, you're going to get more flavor. Now, if you've got a really tough roast, perhaps a rump roast, which is the hardworking uh, hind leg, it's like the ham of a, of a steer, um, that you might throw in a, 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 in a crock pot or a slow cooker. That's a very tenderizing process. And you can make a stew out of that, or you can cut it up into chunks and make a stew. Personally, a prime rib or a tenderloin, I, I want to cook it in a, a warm air rather than warm water. Vernon Kelly Mason. Been following you for 10 years or more. A stalker, eh? Um, I cooked a rib roast in the pit barrel cooker this Christmas. Pit barrel cooker. It's a really fun cooker, by the way. It's just a big old steel barrel. And it works. Works great. There are several brands. Um, the pit barrel is one brand. It's very reasonably priced. And uh, if you're looking for a really macho looking smoker, that's a good one. Oh, and you use my uh, uh, Mrs. O'Leary's cow crust recipe. There's a recipe for beef rub. If you don't want to buy one, um, you can make one. And he and Vernon agrees on removing the bones. Yeah. I mean, I think the bones just make a marvelous meal and you get better all around cooking. And Chris Peterson says he understands. It's good guidance. And he, too, is a longtime fan. Thank you, folks. 
Um, so um, let's see if I can. I got some pictures here now. Let's see if I can do some screen sharing. Stick with me a second. I'm not the most adept at this technology. Um, let's see. I want to show you some of the trimming process. Um, okay, let's see how this works. Let me get rid of this. Okay, get this. And how do I share this? Stick with me. Okay, that's in the way. Nope, okay. Nope, that didn't work. Nope. Aha, okay. I have figured out how to get two programs open at once on this new operating system. And here's the screen share button. Oh, okay. Um, I need uh, somebody to tell me if you can see um, the BFRIB that's on the screen. Um, <clears throat> somebody let me know if, if, yeah, I think you should be able to see it. Okay, this is a classic from the grocery prime rib. And um, you can see it's got a fat cap on top. Let's see. Yep. Okay, Jim, Michael, Renee, thank you for... Okay, you guys can see it. So you can see it's got a very thick fat cap. Now, if you put your rub on that, it's not going to get onto the meat. And when you serve it, everybody's going to cut all that fat off. So there goes your rub. So you want to get rid of that. And you can save that. You can grind it the next time you're having a hamburger and add it to your hamburger mix, which will add a little more fat to your hamburger. And I'll, I'll remind me before this conversation's over to talk to you about increasing the fat of a burger and then doing what everybody tells you not to do, and that is smashing the burger on a grill. If you increase the fat, you can get away with it. And I'll talk, talk about that in a minute. Okay, but you can see in the center, I don't know if my... My cursor is visible, but in the center is a muscle there called the eye of the ribeye. And that's the longissimus dorsi, or the long muscle. And it runs, you've got one running right down your back next to your spine. It's that long tubular muscle that starts up by the shoulder blades on your back and runs all the way to your hip. And the steer has the same thing. That's it right there, the longissimus dorsi. And here is the rib cap. This is the one I was talking about. That's that little, it's the spinalis dorsi. It's a separate muscle. And you see it's got that thick fat layer in between. And a lot of times when you get a ribeye steak, you get these two muscles together on your ribeye steak. In fact, most of the time you do. And you've got this big glob of fat in there, which you've got to work your way around. And often the spinalis is overcooked because it's on the outside and because it's heavily marbled. This muscle is the best muscle on the animal, I'm telling you. It, 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 it's just fantastic. Um, and then finally, down over here, you have what's called the lip or the nose. And it, too, has got a lot of fat in it. And what I like to do is I like to remove the spinalis and set it aside. And that's a separate meal. And I remove the lip or the nose and cut it up. And that's stir fry. And let's see if I have pictures here that demonstrate that. Whoops. Stick with me. Okay. I'm just going to close a couple of these windows here. Uh -huh. Stand by. Well, here, I just want to show you this one. Um, let's see if that's visible. Yeah, you can see that. Um, that is the... Uh, come on with the bone you can see uh, here i'm starting to remove the bone you can remove the bones just by running a knife between the bones and the meat and that picture i showed you a minute ago i had already removed the bones but this is where the bones sit okay let's um see what else i got here Okay, whoop, stop it, 
Stay with me. I just lost my place. Okay. Here on the left, again, forgive me. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but there on the left is the well-trimmed beef roast with both the spinalis and the longissimus together. But look at all the fat that came off of that baby. Almost 15 to 20% is fat. So at 25 to 30 bucks a pound for this monster, you're wasting a lot of money on bone and fat. It's just the way it is. No way of getting around it. And here in the tub, you can see some of the bones. But look at how beautiful and clean that is. And I know that you know that fat is flavor. But remember, it's the fat within the meat. All the fat you can see on that log of meat is going to melt within the meat. And that will give it flavor. This fat that I've trimmed off, the surface, is not going to penetrate the meat. It can't penetrate the meat. The meat is 75% water. The fat is oil. Oil and water don't mix. So that fat layer on the outside, I don't care what you've read, what Chef on TV says, that fat layer is not going to moisturize the meat under any circumstances, any way, anyhow, on this planet or any other planet. It just melts and runs off. It can't get into the meat. What you want is, is the fat within the meat. Okay, let's see what we, what we got here. Oh, okay. So here's the labeling. You got the rib cap, the eye, the fat, and this pan we use for gravy. Now, I'm going to fill that with water. I'm going to throw some carrot. You can see there's bones in there. Um, then I'm going to throw some carrots in there, some celery, some herbs, and you can make gravy out of that. Here's here here it is trimmed up, and you can see clearly the rib cap on the on the right and the eye of the rib over there. And here it is broken down. Here's the rib cap removed, and look at that. It's like a flank steak but it is just effing gorgeous. I'll trim off a little more of this fat. And there's the fat layer that's between the rib cap and the eye of the ribeye, and I'll trim some more of that off. And then to the left is the nose, which I trim down and I make into stew meat or stir fry meat. And there's the final product, the rib cap on the right, and you cook that because it's only about an inch thick. You cook that hot and fast, sear the snot out of it, hot and fast, and it's tender and juicy and spectacular in the middle. And then the ribeye, or the eye of the ribeye, I'll cinch that into a tube. Whoops. And here you can see, here are the two cuts. To the right is just the eye of the ribeye, and I used a rope, and I've tied it up, I've roped it up. And here are the two together, I've left them together in this case, the rib cap on top and the eye of the rib eye underneath. And you got your choice. There you go. With rib cap, without rib cap. And okay. So. And not, the focus is not real good on this, but if you look at this cut. This is a full prime rib that somebody else cooked with all the muscles intact. And you can see B, the rib cap, or here it isn't down in front. It's more focused. Um, again, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but you can see the rib cap is overcooked. It's well done. And the eye of the ribeye, the longissimus is cooked medium rare. And then the nose it's just full of fat, and it's overcooked, too. So breaking it down. Here's a picture of one that's been broken down. That's just the eye of the ribeye. Perfect medium rare, edge to edge, with a good, that's a reverse sear. Here it is again, where I've, you can see it's a little sharper. 
Okay, so stick with me here. Let's see. Now, if you don't reverse here, why is this not okay? There we go. If you don't reverse here, this is the rainbow effect I was talking about. You can see the outer edges are gray. And it doesn't, so you're losing a good portion of the meat. And here's an example of how you might reverse here. I've taken the grates off so you can see. On the left, I've got one burner on full bore, but it's sitting over on the other side, so it's not directly over the flame. And so it's getting gently warmed by convection airflow. Finished product. Now this is one of the rubs that I've mixed with oil and you can spread that on the meat. What do we got here? Ah, okay. This is a really important concept. Again, a lot of the instructors get this wrong. They'll tell you, here, I just got this the other day. This from a really good market. In fact, where I bought my roast. And it's telling me that if it weighs four to five pounds, it takes 60 to 70 minutes to cook at 325. But if it weighs 16 pounds, it takes three and a half to four hours at 325. That's wrong. That's wrong. The thickness of the meat is what determines the cooking time. The heat has to enter the meat from the outside. As the heat enters the meat from the outside, it warms the meat gently until it gets to the center. So it's, here's a 10 pound, four inch. Here's a five pound, four inch thick they take exactly the same amount of time, even though one weighs twice as much as the other, because it's not the weight that determines the cooking time. It's the thickness that determines the cooking time. Very important concept. Now, when it comes to turkey, there is a correlation because the breast, which is the thickest part, tends to be thicker on a more heavy bird. So weight is a factor there, but it's still the thickness. It's the thickness that counts. And there you can see the nice round cinched up roast cooking. Now, in this case, you may see I have a pan underneath and it's catching the drippings. Something you can do is you can take the bones and throw them in that pan and add some celery and some lettuce and some herbs and you can make a incredible beef stock which you can use as a gravy and hard to see but that's what i've done here you can see there's onions in there and carrots there you go a little better picture of the gravy being built And there's your crust, dark brown, lots of flavor. There's the ribs. There's the final product with jolly old St. Nick hoping for his share. Look at that. Isn't that gorgeous? Edge to edge. Now I've left the spinalis in there. You can see right at the top, there's the spinalis. And it hasn't overcooked because I've done the reverse sear. But you can see that ugly layer of fat in between the two. But look at that crust. Is that gorgeous? Okay. Well, I think that is the extent of my roast pictures. Oh, I started to show you something and the camera wasn't on. This is the document I started to show you from my from my butcher. It's, it says how long to cook it, heating instructions, and they want 
60 to 70 minutes for a five pounder and for a 10 pounder, uh, two hours. That's wrong. That's wrong. And they sell a lot of expensive meat. I hope a lot of people weren't uh, turned off by it. I don't see anybody from um, YouTube tonight. And I'm wondering why YouTube isn't joining us. I, I have got to master this technology. Well, I don't see how to turn it on. Okay, well, that covers... Oh, I was going to talk about rendering. Um, my wife and I did some rendering this weekend. Um, and uh, basically, the technique is you take all the fat. Now, you can throw it in a pan on top of the stove, but it's going to be hotter at the bottom. There's a chance it might burn. And it's harder to regulate the temperature up there now, some people will put water in there, which then regulates the temperature because it can't go above 212. But now you're mixing water in with your fat, and you've got to evaporate all the water before you get the fat. Um, you throw, I, I, we throw it in a, 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 a cast iron Dutch oven and put it in the oven at um, about 175. You can crank it up to 225. That's your standard smoker temperature. If you want to do that with the lid off, get a little smoke flavor on your um, uh, your your um, uh, tallow, you can do that. But I like it nice and clean. And so we just put a lid on it, put it in the oven, and it ran for maybe 10 hours. And most of the fat melted. And I got about a little less than a quart of beautiful... It comes... It, 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 when it's melted, it's, it's kind of a golden yellow, but once it solidifies in the fridge, it's creamy white and it's good for French fries. Believe me, trust me. So, okay. Let's see if we've had any more questions here. And, uh, <laughs> yes, Renee, that was Ivy. Um, Yeah, Michael Quick says he takes all that fat cap off, and so do I. Jim Morgan did his ribs in his pit barrel cooker. It's a really good, uh, I mean, his um, uh, prime rib in his cooker. Oh, ribs in his cooker. Everybody loved him. Yeah, Michael, you know, he gets, he, Michael Quick is saying, you've changed the way I barbecue. I get in arguments with people all the time, things like leaving the meat out and such. Um, you know, a lot of chefs say, leave the meat out, let it come to room temperature. It takes hours. A prime rib that's four inches thick will take eight hours to come to room temperature. And guess what? Bacteria have a party. No, you don't want to do that. Plus, cold meat attracts smoke. So go right from the fridge to your smoker, and you'll get more smoke, more better smoke. People will argue that, but that's what the, you know, that's what I do for a living. I break the, I bust myths. Uh, I, I've worked with a food scientist, uh, Professor Greg Blonder, um, and we've tested and we found out, and that's what my book says. Um, if you're arguing, Michael, um, get a copy of my book. Go in and copy the pages that explain why you don't leave meat out at room temperature and hand them the printout. Yeah, um, Renee, you can do it um, uh, in an oven. You don't need to do it on a grill or a smoker. Just um, start, him, uh, start it at 225. Peel, peel off all that fat. If you want to leave the spinalis on, you can. And just get as much of the fat as you can off. Get, make a nice rub. On my website, my Mrs. O'Leary's rub is a really nice one. I have two beef rubs. Pick one. Um, uh, get a nice rub on it. If you want, put a quick layer of oil to help the rub stick. And just cook it along at 225. 
make sure you've got a meat thermometer. Um, and uh, when it gets to about 120, turn it on, turn the broiler on high. And broil on one side for five or 10 minutes till it gets a nice dark brown crust. Rotate it a quarter turn, broil for another five, 10 minutes, another quarter turn, broil until you're all over nice dark brown. Check your temperature, and by then it should have gone to 130, 135, and away you go. Yeah, a lot of people use beef tallow. Uh, if when they're cooking a brisket, beef brisket is usually smoked, and it can take 12 to 18 hours at a very low temperature. And at a certain point in the process, people like to wrap it in aluminum foil or uh, uh, butcher paper. Um, uh, it speeds up the cooking and it makes it a little more tender. Uh, it kind of helps steam and braise it. And they will often put a little beef tallow in there at the same time. I'm not convinced it has much effect. Again, that brisket is 75% water. Beef tallow is 100% oil. Oil and water don't mix. So it may, I don't know what it does. It's not getting into the meat. So, I don't know. Now, here's something else that's fun. Um, if you buy aged beef, um, the fat from aged beef tastes different than fat from fresh beef. Now, I'm talking about dry aged beef. So, if you buy dry aged steaks or dry aged roast, Save that trim. And what I will often do is I will take some of that trim, render it, put it in the fridge, and when I'm grilling a steak, I'll reverse sear a thick steak. Thin steaks, hot and fast. Thick steaks, inch and a half, two inches. Reverse sear, start it indirect, get it close to finished. Then I'll paint it with that aged beef tallow and finish it over the hot flame to get the sear. That aged beef tallow will give the steak a bit of an aged beef flavor. It's kind of neat. Okay. How are we doing out there? I don't, I'm so sorry that uh, usually half our audience is from uh, YouTube. See, I didn't get a chance to check that because I just came back from the basketball game and I switched everything on and I don't remember how to uh, check to make sure YouTube is working. And I'm going to hear about it from my social media director. She's going to beat me up really bad. And I deserve it. Yeah, I know. No grill at the condo. That's okay. You can cook in the oven. A grill is just an outdoor oven. How about some questions, guys? It's um, 8.18. We've been not quite an hour yet. Uh, we'll take it, you know, take it. Let's take another uh, 20 minutes or so. You got to have some questions. Let me take a look over here and see if I've got any more pictures to share that are interesting. Ah, there's a good question. Um, Bobby Granatire, Granatire, if I make your poultry rub from scratch, how long will it last in a container? Poultry rub's called Simon and Garfunkel because it's got parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme. Um, all spices and herbs age. They deteriorate. They have oils in them, which can go rancid. And they have flavoring compounds um, uh, that can oxidize. So if you're starting with good fresh herbs and spices, um, then I would say you're not going to notice any significant change after six months or a year, maybe. But after six months to a year, you might start noticing a deterioration. That poultry rub is really good on chicken. So I use it all the time. 
you'll notice it if it's starting to go downhill. And so make a batch. Don't make a huge batch. And use, uh, use it up. And if you start to see it going downhill, one of the problems is, is the quality of your herbs and spices. Um, uh, you know, there are some really good spice and herb merchants out there. Um, I buy from Penzi's. Um, uh, some people, uh, some people don't like them because they have very strong political views, which they state loudly. Um, and I just, uh, buy quality herbs and spices from the best producers out there. And they are, um, there are other really good, um, herbs and spice producers that the product is pretty fresh. So it lasts longer. Um, some of the big manufacturers, you don't know how long it's been on that grocery store shelf. So, you know, it's an, it's a, it's a crapshoot. Let's see what else I got in here on beef. Oh. Oh, stand by. Aha. Okay, let's go back to screen sharing. Um, this I know how to do. Okay. What you're looking at is a prime rib. And... If you look right, you can see a crack in the meat right here. And that crack, I can stick my thumb in. That is the spinalis and the layer of fat between it. And you can peel it back. You can peel it off practically with your hands. Look at this. Just Now, I mean, it, at, at some point, a little sharp knife comes in handy to complete the job. But... There you go. There's the spinalis dorsi. That's a section of it all cleaned up. That's a gorgeous piece of meat. And then there's the eye of the ribeye. And now, the eye of the ribeye, you can cut into steaks. There we go. That's better. Those are ribeye steaks. And then here's the spinalis in a uh, plastic zipper bag. Let's see what else we got here. Okay. Here's another spinalis removal operation with a knife this time. Hey, oh, there, that's a good shot. Peeling the spinalis back, cutting it through. Excellent. There you go. That's a good sequence. Let's Let's start that again and do that sort of slow-mo here. Okay. Here we go. Starting with the knife right at where the spinalis, you can see that curved muscle sitting on top of the longissimus. It's also called the rib cap instead of spinalis. The rib cap and the eye of the rib eye instead of longissimus. You can see I'm peeling the rib cap back. Using my knife a little bit to complete the job. Separate it out. There you have it on the right, the untrimmed rib cap. On the left, the untrimmed eye. And, okay, so on the left is the eye of the ribeye, but the nose is still attached, that pointy edge. And you can see there's the trim there that came off, the fat, and there's some meat. That's the final spinalis. Okay. Ah, and that's what the spinalis looks like cooked. And it's just gorgeous. Let's see what else we got here. There. There we go. Hot and fast. Gosh, I have a fun job, don't I? Okay. All right, let's put the pictures away.
All right, we're back. Let's see if we got any more questions or comments. Well, Bob Granitier says the poultry rub, he's, you've made it, so it's very good. Skin on or skin off grilling fish. You know, um, it depends on the fish. Some fish will just fall apart without the skin. Um, I live in the Chicago area, and fresh fish is really hard to get. And I was raised in Florida where fresh fish was an essential part of my diet. And a few years ago, we discovered a company called Sitka Salmon Shares. Sitka is a little tick town in Alaska, S-I-T-K-A. They've changed their name to Sitka Seafood, I think. Um, but they ship frozen seafood from Alaska. And I think now they're bringing in some Atlantic seafood as well. And it is just effing amazing. They have superlative freezing process that when it thawed, I've never had a bad piece of fishy smelling. Um, they, it, they're just spot on. They're expensive. But if you're like me and you're landlocked, um, and they send me, you know, line caught salmon, and you, the skin is on. And we usually just leave it on. I like to cook it so that the skin gets crispy, and I like it. My wife doesn't. Um, so there. Um, could you inject prime rib? You could, but there's no real need to. Uh, it's so moist. Now, if you've got yourself a, a piece of rump or uh, round, which is from the rump, and it's not all that moist, you might want to inject. But what are you going to inject it with? You know, I mean, now people do inject brisket, which is really tough. And they use salt solutions and potassium compounds. I just, you know, I'm not a big injecting fan. I will confess, I do on a rare occasion inject turkey breast. And I inject it with butter. You have to wait till it's partially cooked. You can't inject a cold turkey breast with butter. Because the butter, even if it's melted, it hits the cold chicken turkey and it seizes up, clogs up the needle, and you get lumps of butter. And the... so you got to start cooking the turkey, and when it gets to about a hundred degrees, then you can fill your uh, needle with uh, melted butter and inject it. And that that works pretty good for me. But I don't inject much, much, much anything else. All righty, well, we've been at it for an hour. I'm kind of tired. This has been a bit long week. I just uh, just got back from Florida myself, Renee. I uh, um, had to spend some time with my 98-year-old mother who's not doing all that well and then come back and do all the cooking and everything for Christmas. So how about we call it a night at an hour? Well, usually I go an hour and a half, but... Uh, I don't see any more questions, and uh, doggone it, we don't have the YouTube crowd in here to make it uh, with more questions. So I'm just going to thank you for your patience and your attention, and I hope I've shared something of use to you. And uh, I hope if you, um, the concepts, you know, a lot of these core concepts apply to other things. Chicken, you can reverse sear chicken. In fact, you should. Because when you cook chicken over hot flame, what happens? You burn the skin. And then when you cut into it, it's raw. I mean, how many times have you gone to a Fourth of July party and they hand you a drumstick that's black on the outside and bloody on the inside? Well, it's not really blood. It's myoglobin, but still. And that it's slippery. and yeah, 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 yeah. Um, So you, 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 you reverse sear is a really core basic tenet and if you learn two-zone cooking, hot side, cool side, if you're cooking indoor, you low temperature roast, high temperature broil. That's your two-step. You cook the inside and the outside separately. That's the core concept. And I didn't invent reverse here. It's been around for years. In fact, the sous vide process has been reverse searing for years. But I think I'm responsible for popularizing it. I've been preaching it loud and strong like I did tonight on my website, in my books, in these seminars for years, and it's really catching on now. 
course, nobody gives me credit, but that's okay. Um, it's really spreading now. And if you learn two-zone cooking on your grill, if you learn cook the inside and the outside separately and learn how to reverse sear, learning thermometers, use a thermometer, you're way ahead of the game. You've really learned a lot. So with that thought, I've been hearing, uh, thank you very nice, some nice, nice people saying nice things. I'm going to call it a night if you'll permit me. I have a glass of wine here, and I'm, usually I'm sipping while we're doing this, and I didn't get a sip of wine yet. So I'm going to have a sip of wine and uh, get to bed early. And uh, what's going on? Oh, staff meeting tomorrow. Yay! Don't we love meetings? Uh, and I, I, because my m mother is not all that well, I've managed to escape staff meeting two weeks in a row. Mm. All right, guys. Thanks for your attention. Thanks for hanging out with me. Um, remember um, that uh, uh, cooking any anything you can cook indoors, you can cook outdoors. Only better. And uh, uh, have a lot of fun with your cooking. And wish you a happy new year. <laughs>